Father Goriet. Hanor D. Belzac. The Project Gutenberg Ebook of Father Goriet. By Hanor D. Belzac. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.net. Title, Father Goriet. Author, Honor D. Belzac. Release date, October 6, 2004. Ebook number 1237. Language, English. Character set encoding, ASCII. Asterisk 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 start of this project Gutenberg EBOK Father GRIOTI asterisk asterisk asterisk. Produced by Daphne. Father GRIOTI. By Honor D. Belzac. Translated by Ellen Marriage. To the great and illustrious Geoffroy Saint Hilaire, the token of admiration for his works and genius. D. Belzac. Three of them. Said Sylvie. Then the second daughter, who had first come in the morning to see her father, came shortly afterwards in the evening. She wore a ball dress, and came in a carriage. Four of them, commented Madame Vorcure and her plum handmaid. Sylvie saw not a trace of resemblance between this great lady and the girl in her simple morning dress who had entered her kitchen on the occasion of her first visit. At that time Goriot was paying twelve hundred francs a year to his landlady, and Madame Vorkyu saw nothing out of the common in the fact that a rich man had four or five mistresses, nay, she thought it very knowing of him to pass them off as his daughters. She was not at all inclined to draw a hard and fast line, or to take umbrage at his sending for them to the Maison Vorkyu, yet, inasmuch as these visits explained her boarder's indifference to her, she went so far at the end of the second year as to speak of him as an ugly old wretch. When at length her boarder declined to nine hundred francs a year, she asked him very insolently what he took her house to be, after meeting one of these ladies on the stairs. Father Goriot answered that the lady was his eldest daughter. So you have two or three dozen daughters, have you? said Madame Vorcure sharply. I have only two, her boarder answered meekly, like a ruined man who is broken into all the cruel usage of misfortune. Towards the end of the third year Father Goriot reduced his expenses still further, he went up to the third story and now pay 45 francs a month. He did without snuff, told his hairdresser that he no longer required his services, and gave up wearing powder. When Goriot appeared for the first time in this condition, an exclamation of astonishment broke from his hostess at the color of his hair a g olive gray. He had grown sadder day by day under the influence of some hidden trouble. Among all the faces round the table, his was the most woe-begone. There was no longer any doubt. Goriot was an elderly libertine, whose eyes had only been preserved by the skill of the physician from the malign influence of the remedies necessitated by the state of his health. The disgusting color of his hair was a result of his excesses and of the drugs which he had taken that he might continue his career. The poor old man's mental and physical condition afforded some grounds for the absurd rubbish talked about him. When his outfit was worn out, he replaced the fine linen by calico at 14 underscore sue underscore the L. His diamonds, his gold snuff box, watch chain and trinkets, disappeared one by one. He had left off wearing the cornflower blue coat, and was sumptuously arrayed, summer as well as winter, in a coarse chestnut brown coat, a plush waist coat, and doe skin breeches. He grew thinner and thinner, his legs were shrunken, his cheeks, once so puffed out by contented bourgeois prosperity, were covered with wrinkles, and the outlines of the jaw bones were distinctly visible. There were deep furrows in his forehead. In the fourth year of his residence in the Rue Nude Saint Genevieve, he was no longer like his former self. The hale vermicelli manufacturer, 62 years of age, who had looked scarce 40, the stout, comfortable, prosperous tradesman, with an almost bucolic air, and such a brisk demeanor that it did you good to look at him, the man with something boyish in his smile, had suddenly sunk into his dotage, and had become a feeble vacillating septuagenarian. The keen, bright blue eyes had grown dull, and faded to a steel gray color, the red inflamed rims looked as though they had shed tears of blood. He excited feelings of repulsion in some, and of pity in others. The young medical students who came to the house noticed the drooping of his lower lip and the conformation of the facial angle, and, after teasing him for some time to no purpose, 
they declared that cretinism was setting in. One evening after dinner Madame Vorkur said half banteringly to him, So those daughters of yours don't come to see you anymore, eh? Meaning to imply her doubts as to his paternity, but Father Gorit shrank as if his hostess had touched him with a sword point. They come sometimes, he said in a tremulous voice. Ha ha! You still see them sometimes? cried the student. Bravo, Father Goriet. The old man scarcely seemed to hear the witticisms at his expense that followed on the words, he had relapsed into the dreamy state of mind that these superficial observers took for senile torpor, due to his lack of intelligence. If they had only known, they might have been deeply interested by the problem of his condition, but few problems were more obscure. It was easy, of course, to find out whether Goriet had really been a vermicelli manufacturer, the amount of his fortune was readily discoverable, but the old people, who were most inquisitive as to his concerns, never went beyond the limits of the quarter, and lived in the lodging house much as oysters cling to a rock. As for the rest, the current of life in Paris daily awaited them, and swept them away with it, so soon as they left the Rue Nude Saint Genevieve, they forgot the existence of the old man, there but at dinner. For those narrow souls, or for careless youth, the misery in Father Goriat's withered face and its dull apathy were quite incompatible with wealth or any sort of intelligence. As for the creatures whom he called his daughters, all Madame Vorkur boarders were of her opinion. With the faculty for severe logic sedulously cultivated by elderly women during long evenings of gossip till they can always find an hypothesis to fit all circumstances, she was one to reason thus. If Father Goriat had daughters of his own as rich as those ladies who came here seemed to be, he would not be lodging in my house, on the third floor, at forty-five francs a month, and he would not go about dressed like a poor man. No objection could be raised to these inferences. So by the end of the month of November 1819, at the time when the curtain rises on this drama, everyone in the house had come to have a very decided opinion. As to the poor old man, he had never had either wife or daughter, excesses had reduced him to this sluggish condition. He was a sort of human mollusk who should be classed among the Capula duck, so one of the dinner contingent, an underscore employee underscore at the museum, who had a pretty wit of his own. Toirette was an eagle, a gentleman, compared with Goriet. Toirette would join the talk, argue, answer when he was spoken to. As a matter of fact, his talk, arguments, and responses contributed nothing to the conversation, for Poirot had a habit of repeating what the others said in different words, still, he did join in the talk, he was alive, and seemed capable of feeling, while Father Goriot to quote the museum official again was invariably at zero degrees from your Eugene de Rastignac had just returned to Paris in a state of mind not unknown to young men who are conscious of unusual powers, and to those whose faculties are so stimulated by a difficult position, that for the time being they rise above the ordinary level. Drastignac's first year of study for the preliminary examinations in law had left him free to see the sights of Paris and to enjoy some of its amusements. A student has not much time on his hands if he sets himself to learn the repertory of every theatre, and to study the ins and outs of the labyrinth of Paris. To know its customs, to learn the language, and become familiar with the amusements of the capital, he must explore its recesses, good and bad, follow the studies that please him best and form some idea of the treasures contained in galleries and museums. At this stage of his career a student grows eager and excited about all sorts of follies that seem to him to be of immense importance. He has his hero, his great man, a professor at the College de France, paid to talk down to the level of his audience. He adjusts his cravat, and strikes various attitudes for the benefit of the women in the first galleries at the Opera Comique. As he passes through all these successive initiations, and breaks out of his sheath, the horizons of life widen around him, and at length he grasps the plan of society with the different human strata of which it is composed. If he begins by admiring the procession of carriages on funny afternoons in the Champs-Élysées, he soon reaches the further stage of envying their owners. Unconsciously, Eugene had served his apprenticeship before he went back to Angoulême for the long vacation after taking his degrees as Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Law. The illusions of childhood had vanished, so also had the ideas he brought with him from the provinces, he had returned thither with an intelligence developed, with loftier ambitions, and saw things as they were at home in the old manor house. 
his father and mother, his two brothers and two sisters, with an aged aunt, whose whole fortune consisted in annuities, lived on the little estate of Drastignac. The whole property brought in about 3,000 francs, and though the amount varied with the season as must always be the case in a vine-growing district they were obliged to spare an uncarrying 1,200 francs out of their income for him. He saw how constantly the poverty, which they had generously hidden from him, weighed upon them. He could not help comparing the sisters, who had seemed so beautiful to his boyish eyes, with women in Paris, who had realized the beauty of his dreams. The uncertain future of the whole family depended upon him. It did not escape his eyes that not a crumb was wasted in the house, nor that the wine they drank was made from the second pressing, a multitude of small things, which it is useless to speak of in detail here, made him burn to distinguish himself, and his ambition to succeed increased tenfold. He meant, like all great souls, that his success should be owing entirely to his merits, but his was preeminently a southern temperament. The execution of his plans was sure to be marked by the vertigo that seizes on youth when youth sees itself alone in a wide sea, uncertain. How to spend its energies, whither to steer its course, how to adapt its sails to the winds. At first he determined to fling himself heart and soul into his work, but he was diverted from this purpose by the need of society and connections. Then he saw how great an influence women exert in social life, and suddenly made up his mind to go out into this world to seek a protectress there. Surely a clever and high-spirited young man, whose wit and courage were set off to advantage by a graceful figure and a vigorous kind of beauty that readily strikes a woman's imagination, need not despair of finding a protectress. These ideas occurred to him in his country walks with his sisters, whom he had once joined so gaily. The girls thought him very much changed. His aunt, Madame de Marseillac, had been presented at court and had moved among the brightest heights of that lofty region. Suddenly the young man's ambition discerned in those recollections of hers, which had been like nursery fairy tales to her nephews and nieces, the elements of a social success at least as important as the success which he had achieved at the Acaldedrite. He began to ask his aunt about those relations, some of the old ties might still hold good. After much shaking of the branches of the family tree, the old lady came to the conclusion that of all persons who could be useful to her nephew among the selfish genus of rich relations, the Vicontess de Beauchamp was the least likely to refuse. To this lady, therefore, she wrote in the old-fashioned style, recommending Eugene to her, pointing out to her nephew that if he succeeded in pleasing Madame de Beauchamp, the Vicontess would introduce him to other relations. A few days after his return to Paris, therefore, Drastignac sent his aunt's letter to Madame de Beauchamp. The Vicontess replied by an invitation to a ball for the following evening. This was the position of affairs at the Maison Vaucour at the end of November 1819. A few days later, after Madame de Beauchamp's ball, Eugene came in at two o'clock in the morning. The persevering student meant to make up for the lost time by working until daylight. It was the first time that he had attempted to spend the night in this way in that silent quarter. The spell of a factitious energy was upon him, he had beheld the pomp and splendor of the world. He had not dined at the Maison Vaucure, the boarders probably would think that he would walk home at daybreak from the dance, as he had done sometimes on former occasions, after a fete at the Prado, or a ball at the Odeon, splashing his silk stockings thereby, and ruining his pumps. It so happened that Christophe took a look into the street before drawing the bolts of the door, and Rastignac, coming in at that moment, could go up to his room without making any noise, followed by Christophe, who made a great deal. Eugene exchanged his dress suit for a shabby overcoat and slippers, kindled the fire with some blocks of patent fuel, and prepared for his night's work in such a sort that the faint sounds he made were drowned by Christophe's heavy tramp on the stairs. Eugene sat absorbed in thought for a few moments before plunging into his law books. He had just become aware of the fact that the Vicontess de Beauchamp was one of the queens of fashion, that her house was thought to be the pleasantest in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. And not only so, she was, by right of her fortune, and the name she bore, one of the most conspicuous figures in that aristocratic world. Thanks to the aunt, thanks to Madame de Marseille's letter of introduction. The poor student had been kindly received in that house before he knew the extent of the favor thus shown to him. 
It was almost like a patent of nobility to be admitted to those gilded salons. He had appeared in the most exclusive circle in Paris, and now all doors were open for him. Eugene had been dazzled at first by the brilliant assembly, and had scarcely exchanged a few words with the Vicontess. He had been content to single out a goddess among the throng of Frisian divinities, one of those women who are sure to attract a young man's fancy. But Countess Anastasia de Rester was tall and gracefully made. She had one of the prettiest figures in Paris. Imagine a pair of great dark eyes, a magnificently molded hand, a shapely foot. There was a fiery energy in her movements. The Marquis de Rontrolles had called her a thoroughbred, the pure pedigree. These figures of speech have replaced the heavenly angel and oceanic nomenclature. The old mythology of love is extinct, doomed to perish by modern dandyism. But for Rastignac, Madame Anastasia de Rester was the woman for whom he had sighed. He had contrived to write his name twice upon the list of partners upon her fan, and had snatched a few words with her during the first quadrille. Where shall I meet you again, madam? He asked abruptly, and the tones of his voice were full of the vehement energy that women like so well. Oh, everywhere, said she, in the bois, at the Bouffins, in my own house. With the impetuosity of his adventurous southern temper, he did all he could to cultivate an acquaintance with this lovely countess, making the best of his opportunities in the quadrille and during a waltz that she gave him. When he told her that he was a cousin of Madame de Bauchens, the countess, whom he took for a great lady, asked him to call at her house, and after her parting smile, Rastignac felt convinced that he must make this visit. He was so lucky as to light upon someone who did not laugh at his ignorance, the fatal defect among the gilded and insolent youth of that period. The coterie of Holland Sourts, Maxime's de Trails, de Marseilles, Front Rolls, Agita Pintos, and Vandinesses who shone there in all the glory of Coxcomb were among the best dressed women of fashion in Paris Lady Brandon, the Duchess de Lantius, the Comtesse de Curperouet, Madame de Cerise, the Duchess de Carigliano, the Comtesse de Rod, Madame de Lanty, the Marquise de Clement, Madame Fermiani. The Marquise de Listomere and the Marquise d'Espard, the Duchess de Montfortnutes and the Granvilles. Luckily, therefore, for him, the novice happened upon the Marquise de Montrivo, the lover of the Duchess de Lantius, the general as simple as a child. From him Rastignac learned that the Comtesse lived in the Rue du Tel Dirt. Ah, what it is to be young, eager to see the world, greedily on the watch for any chance that brings you nearer the woman of your dreams and behold two houses opened their doors to you. To set foot in the Vicontess de Bauchens' house in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, to fall on your knees before a Comtesse de Restaurant in the Chaussée d'Anton, to look at one glance across the vista of Paris drawing rooms, conscious that, possessing sufficient good looks, you may hope to find aid and protection there in a feminine heart. To feel ambitious enough to spurn the tight road on which you must walk with the steady head of an acrobat for whom the fall is impossible, and to find in a charming woman the best of all balancing poles. He sat there with his thoughts for a while, law on the one hand, and poverty on the other, beholding the radiant vision of a woman rise above the dull, smoldering fire. Who would not have paused and questioned the future as Eugene was doing? Who would not have pictured it full of success? His wandering thoughts took wings, he was transported out of the present into that blissful future, he was sitting by Madame de Restre's side, when a sort of sigh, like the grunt of an overburdened Saint Joseph, broke the silence of the night. It vibrated through the student, who took the sound for a death groan. He opened his door noiselessly, went out upon the landing, and saw a thin streak of light under Father Goriette's door. Eugene feared that his neighbor had been taken ill. He went over and looked through the keyhole. The old man was busily engaged in an occupation so singular and so suspicious that Rastignac thought he was only doing a piece of necessary service to society to watch the self-styled vermicelli. Maker's nocturnal industries. The table was upturned, and Goriot had doubtless in some way secured a silver plate and cup to the bar before knotting a thick rope round them. He was pulling at this rope with such enormous force that they were being crushed and twisted out of shape to all appearance. He meant to convert the richly wrought metal into ingots. Underscore pest exclamation point underscore what a man. Said Rastignac, as he watched Goriette's muscular arms, there was not a sound in the room while the old man, with the aid of the rope, 
was kneading the silver like dough. Was he then, indeed, a thief, or a receiver of stolen goods, who affected imbecility and decrepitude, and lived like a beggar that he might carry on his pursuits the more securely? Eugene stood for a moment revolving these questions, then he looked again through the keyhole. Father Goriot had unwound his coil of rope, he had covered the table with a blanket, and was now employed in rolling the flattened mass of silver into a barn, an operation which he performed with marvelous dexterity. Why, he must be as strong as Augustus, King of Poland, said Eugene to himself when the bar was nearly finished. Father Goriot looked sadly at his handiwork. Tears fell from his eyes. He blew out the dip which had served him for a light while he manipulated the silver, and Eugene heard him sigh as he lay down again. He is mad, thought the student. Underscore poor child exclamation point underscore father Goriot said aloud. Rastignac, hearing those words, concluded to keep silence. He would not hastily condemn his neighbor. He was just in the doorway of his room when a strange sound from the staircase below reached his ears. It might have been made by two men coming up in list slippers. Eugene listened. Two men there certainly were. He could hear their breathing. Yet there had been no sound of opening the street door. No footsteps in the passage. Suddenly, too, he saw a faint gleam of light on the second story. It came from Aunt Vortran's room. There are a good many mysteries here for a lodging house. He said to himself. He went part of the way downstairs and listened again. The rattle of gold reached his ears. In another moment the light was put out, and again he distinctly heard the breathing of two men, but no sound of a door being opened or shut. The two men went downstairs, the faint sounds growing fainter as they went. Who is there? cried Madame Vorkule out of her bedroom window. I, Madame Vorkule, answered Vortran's deep bass voice. I am coming in. That is odd. Christophe drew the bolts said Eugene, going back to his room. You have to sit up at night, it seems, if you really mean to know all that is going on about you in Paris. These incidents turned his thought from his ambitious dreams. He betook himself to his work, but his thought wandered back to Father Goriot's suspicious occupation. Madame D. Rest of face swam again and again before his eyes like a vision of a brilliant future, and at last he lay down and slept with clenched fists. When a young man makes up his mind that he will work all night, the chances are that seven times out of ten he will sleep till morning. Such vigils do not begin before we are turned twenty. The next morning Paris was wrapped in one of the dense fogs that throw the most punctual people out in their calculations as to the time. Even the most business-like folk fail to keep their appointments in such weather, and ordinary mortals wake up at noon and fancy it is eight o'clock. On this morning it was half past nine and Madame Vorkur still lay abed. Christophe was late, Sylvie was late, but the two sat comfortably taking their coffee as usual. It was Sylvie's custom to take the cream off the milk destined for the boarder's breakfast for her own, and to boil the remainder for some time, so that Madame should not discover this illegal exaction. Sylvie, said Christophe, as he dipped a piece of toast into the coffee, and Vortran, who is not such a bad sort, all the same. Had two people come to see him again last night. If Madame says anything, mind you say nothing about it. Has he given you something? He gave me a five franc piece this month, which is as good as saying, hold your tongue. Except him and Madame. Couture, who doesn't look twice at every penny, there's no one in the house that doesn't try to get back with the left hand all that they give with the right at New Year, said Sylvie. And, after all, said Christophe, what do they give you? A miserable five franc piece. There's Father Goriot, who has cleaned his shoes himself these two years past. There is that old beggar Poirot, who goes without blacking altogether, he would sooner drink it than put it on his boots. Then there is that whipper snapper of a student, who gives me a couple of francs. Two francs will not pay for my brushes, and he sells his old clothes, and gets more for them than they are worth. Oh! They're a shabby lot. Pooh! said Sylvie, sipping her coffee, our places are the best in the quarter, that I know. But about that great big chap Vortran, Christophe, has anyone told you anything about him? Yes. I met a gentleman in the street a few days ago, he said to me, there's a gentleman in your place, isn't there? The tall man that eyes his whiskers? I told him, no, sir, 
they aren't died. The gay fellow like him hasn't the time to do it. And when I told M. Vortran about it afterwards, he said, Quite right, my boy. That is the way to answer them. There is nothing more unpleasant than to have your little weaknesses known. It might spoil many a match. Well, and for my part, said Silve, a man tried to humbug me at the market wanting to know if I had seen him put on his shirt. Such bosh. There, she cried, interrupting herself. That's a quarter to ten striking at the Val de Grace. And not the soul stern. Pooh. They are all gone out. Madame. Couture and the girl went out at eight o'clock to take the wafer at St. Adrian. Father Goriot started off somewhere with a parcel, and the student won't be back from his lecture till ten o'clock. I saw them go while I was sweeping the stairs. Father Goriot knocked up against me, and his parcel was as hard as iron. What is the old fellow up to? I wondered. He is as good as a plaything for the rest of them. They can never let him alone, but he is a good man, all the same, and worth more than all of them put together. He doesn't give you much himself, but he sometimes sends you a message to ladies who fork out famous tips. They are dressed grandly, too. His daughters, as he calls them, eh? There are a dozen of them. I have never been to more than two the two who came here. There is Madame moving overhead. I shall have to go, or she will raise a fine racket. Just keep an eye on the milk, Christophe. Don't let the cat get at it. Sylvie went up to her mistress' room. Sylvie? How is this? It's nearly ten o'clock, and you let me sleep like a dormouse. Such a thing has never happened before. It's the fog, it is that thick, you could cut it with a knife. But how about breakfast? Bob? The boarders are possessed, I'm sure. They all cleared out before there was a wink of daylight. Do speak properly, Sylvie, Madame. Vorkuri retorted, say a blink of daylight. Ah, well, Madam, whichever you please. Anyhow, you can have breakfast at ten o'clock. La Macbinette and Toiret have neither of them stirred. There are only those two upstairs, and they are sleeping like the logs they are. But, Sylvie, you put their names together as if... As if what? Said Sylvie, bursting into a guffaw. The two of them make a pair. It is a strange thing, isn't it, Sylvie, how M. Vortran got in last night after Christophe had bolted the door? Not at all, madam. Christophe heard M. Vortran, and went down and undid the door. And here are you imagining that? Give me my bodice, and be quick and get breakfast ready. Dish up the rest of the mutton with the potatoes, and you can put the stewed pears on the table, those at five a penny. A few moments later madame. Vorkur came down, just in time to see the cat knock down a plate that covered a bowl of milk, and begin to lap in all haste. Mist Grease! She cried. The cat fled, but promptly returned to rub against her ankles. Oh! Yes, you can wiggle, you old hypocrite! She said. Sylvie? Sylvie? Yes, madam, what is it? Just see what the cat has done. It is all that stupid Christophe's fault. I told him to stop and lay the table. What has become of him? Don't you worry, madam, Father Goriot shall have it. I will fill it up with water, and he won't know the difference, he never notices anything, not even what he eats. I wonder where the old heathen can have gone, said Madame Vorkure, setting the plates round the table. Who knows? He is up to all sorts of tricks. I have overslept myself, said Madame Vorkure. But Madame looks as fresh as a rose, all the same. The doorbell rang at that moment, and Vortran came through the sitting room, singing loudly. Tis the same old story everywhere, a roving heart and a roving glance. Oh! Mama Vorkure! Good morning! He cried at the sight of his hostess, and he put his arm gaily round her waist. There! Have done! Impertinence! Say it! He answered. Come, say it! Now, isn't that what you really mean? Stop a bit, I will help you to set the table. Ah! I am a nice man, am I not? For the locks of brown and the golden hair a sighing lover. Oh! I have just seen something so funny. Led by chance. What? Asked the widow. Father Cory at in the goldsmith's shop in the Rue Dauphine at half past eight this morning. They buy old spoons and forks and gold lace there, 
and Bori had sold a piece of silver plate for a good round sum. It had been twisted out of shape very neatly for a man that's not used to the trade. Really? You don't say so? Yes. One of my friends is expatriating himself. I had been to see him off on board the Royal Mail steamer, and was coming back here. I waited after that to see what Father Goriot would do, it is a comical affair. He came back to this quarter of the world, to the Rue de Gretels, and went into a moneylender's house, everybody knows him, Godsec, a stuck-up rascal, that would make dominoes out of his father's bones, a Turk, a heathen, an old Jew, a Greek, it would be a difficult matter to Ron underscore him underscore, for he puts all his coin into the bank. Then what was Father Goriot doing there? Doing? Said Wartran. Nothing, he was bent on his own undoing. He is a simpleton, stupid enough to ruin himself by running after. There he is! Cried Sylvie. Christophe, cried Father Goriot's voice, come upstairs with me. Christophe went up, and shortly afterwards came down again. Where are you going? Madame? Vorku asked of her servant. Out on an errand for M. Goriot. What may that be? Said Vortran, pouncing on a letter in Christophe's hand. Underscore Madame. La Contesse Anastasie D. Restored underscore, he read. Where are you going with it? He added, as he gave the letter back to Christophe. To the Rue du Hell Dirt. I have orders to give this into her hands myself. What is there inside it? Said Vortran, holding the letter up to the light. A bank note? No. He peered into the envelope. The receipted account. He cried. My word. Tis a gallant old dotard. Off with you, old chap, he said, bringing down the hand on Christophe's head, and spinning the man round like a thimble, you will have a famous tip. By this time the table was set. Sylvie was boiling the milk, Madame. Vorkure was lighting the fire in the stove with some assistance from Vortran, who kept humming to himself. The same old story everywhere, a roving heart and a roving glance. When everything was ready, Madame, Couture and Mademoiselle, Tom Yetfer came in. Where have you been this morning, fair lady? Said Madame, Vorkure, turning to Madame, Couture. We have just been to say our prayers at Saint Adrien du Mont. Today is the day when we must go to see M. Tom Yetfer. Poor little thing. She is trembling like a leaf, Madame. Couture went on, as she seated herself before the fire and held the steaming so lace of her boots to the blaze. Warm yourself, Victorine, said Madame. Vorkure. It is quite right and proper, Mademoiselle, to pray to heaven to soften your father's heart, said Vortran, as he drew a chair nearer to the orphan girl, but that is not enough. What you want is a friend who will give a monster a piece of his mind, a barbarian that has three million so they say and will not give you a dowry and a pretty girl needs a dowry nowadays. Poor child. Said Madame. Vorkure. Never mind, my pet, your wretch of a father is going just the way to bring trouble upon himself. Victorine's eyes filled with tears at the words, and the widow checked herself at a sign from Madame. Couture. If we could only see him. Said the commissary general's widow, if I could speak to him myself and give him his wife's last letter. I have never dared to run the risk of sending it by post, he knew my hand driving. O oh, woman, persecuted and injured innocent! exclaimed Vortran, breaking in upon her. So that is how you are, is it? In a few days' time I will look into your affairs, and it will be all right, you shall see. Oh, sir, said Victorine, with a tearful but eager glance at Vortran, who showed no sign of being touched by it. If you know of any way of communicating with my father, please be sure and tell him that his affection and my mother's honor are more to me than all the money in the world. If you can induce him to relent a little towards me, I will pray to God for you. You may be sure of my gratitude. Underscore the same old story everywhere underscore, sang Vortran, with a satirical intonation. At this juncture, Goriot, Mademoiselle, Mikanino, and Poirot came downstairs together. Possibly the scent of the gravy which Sylvie was making to serve with the mutton had announced breakfast. The seven people thus assembled bade each other good morning, and took their places at the table. The clock struck ten, and the student's footstep was heard outside. Ah! Here you are, M. Eugene, said Sylvie, 
everyone is breakfasting at home to date. The student exchanged greetings with the lodgers, and sat down beside Goriet. I have just met with a queer adventure, he said, as he helped himself abundantly to the mutton, and cut a slice of bread, which Madame Vorkua's eyes gauged as usual. An adventure? queried Poirot. Well, and what is there to astonish you in that, old boy? Vortran asked of Poirot. M. Eugene is cut out for that kind of thing. Mademoiselle. Tom yet first stole a timid glance at the young student. Tell us about your adventure. Demanded M. Vortran. Yesterday evening I went to a ball given by a cousin of mine, the Vicontess de Bauchent. She has a magnificent house, the rooms are hung with silk, in short, it was a splendid affair, and I was as happy as a king. Fisher, put in Vortran, interrupting. What do you mean, sir? said Eugene sharply. I said Fisher, because King Fisher see a good deal more fun than kings. Quite true, I would much rather be the little careless bird than a king, said Poirot Medivobist, because... In fact the law student cut him short I danced with one of the handsomest women in the room, the charming countess, the most exquisite creature I have ever seen. There was peach blossom in her hair, and... She had the loveliest bouquet of flowers real flowers, that scented the air but there. It is no use trying to describe a woman glowing with a dance. You ought to have seen her. Well, and this morning I met this divine countess about nine o'clock, on foot in the Rue de Greville's. Oh, how my heart beat. I began to think that she was coming here, said Vortran, with a keen look at the student. I expect that she was going to call on old Godsack, the money lender. If ever you explore a Prussian woman's heart, you will find the money lender first and the lover afterwards. Your countess is called Anastasia de Restard, and she lives in the Rue du Tel Dirt. The student stared hard at Vortran. Father Gory raised his head at the words, and gave the two speakers a glance so full of intelligence and uneasiness that the lodgers beheld him with astonishment. Then Christophe was too late, and she must have gone to him. Cried Gory it, with anguish in his voice. It is just as I guessed, said Vortran, leaning over to whisper in Madame. Vorkua's ear. Goriot went on with his breakfast, but seemed unconscious of what he was doing. He had never looked more stupid nor more taken up with his own thoughts than he did at that moment. Who the devil could have told you her name, M. Vortran? Asked Eugene. Ha ha. There you are. Answered Vortran. Old Father Goriot there knew it quite well. And why should I not know it too? M. Goriot. The student cried. What is it? Asked the old man. So she was very beautiful, was she, yesterday night? Who? Madame? D. Restaurant. Look at the old wretch, said Madame. Vorkure, speaking to Vortran, how his eyes light up. Then does he really keep her? Said Mademoiselle. Mickey out, in a whisper to the student. Oh. Yes, she was tremendously pretty, Eugene answered. Father Goriot watched him with eager eyes. If Madame de Bauchent had not been there, my divine countess would have been the queen of the ball, none of the younger men had eyes for anyone else. I was the twelfth on her list, and she danced every quadrille. The other women were furious. She must have enjoyed herself, if ever creature did. It is a true saying that there is no more beautiful sight than a frigate in full sail, the galloping horse, or a woman dancing. So the wheel turns, said Vortran, yesterday night at a duchess. Ball this morning in a money lender's office, on the lowest rung of the ladder just like a Parisian. If their husbands cannot afford to pay for their frantic extravagance, they will sell themselves. Or if they cannot do that, they will tear out their mother's hearts to find something to pay for their splendor. They will turn the world upside down. Just a Parisian through and through. Father Goriet's face, which had shone at the student's words like the sun on a bright day, clouded over all at once at this cruel speech of Vortrance. Well, said Madame Vorkure, but where is your adventure? Did you speak to her? Did you ask her if she wanted to study law? She did not see me, said Eugene. But only think of me being one of the prettiest women in Paris in the Rue de Graville's at nine o'clock. She could not have reached home after the ball till two o'clock this morning. Wasn't it queer? There is no place like Paris for this sort of adventures. Shaw. Much funnier things than underscore that underscore happen here, exclaimed Vortran. 
mademoiselle. Ta Yefer had scarcely heeded the talk. She was so absorbed by the thought of the new attempt that she was about to make. Madame Couture made a sign that it was time to go upstairs and dress. The two ladies went out, and Father Goriot followed their example. Well, did you see? said Madame Vorcure, addressing Vortran and the rest of the circle. He is ruining himself for those women, that is plain. Nothing will ever make me believe that that beautiful Contest de Restaurant is anything to Father Goriet, cried the student. Well, and if you don't, broke in Vortran, we are not set on convincing you. You are too young to know Paris thoroughly yet. Later on you will find out that there are what we call men with a passion. Mademoiselle. Mickenito out gave Vortran a quick glance at these words. They seemed to be like the sound of a drum but to a trooper's horse. Ha ha. Said Vortran stopping in his speech to give her a searching glance, so we have had our little experiences, have we? The old maid lowered her eyes like a nun who sees a statue. Well, he went on, when folk of that kind get the notion into their heads, they cannot drop it. They must drink the water from some particular spring it is stagnant as often as not, but they will sell their wives and families, they will sell their own souls to the devil to get it. For some this spring is play, or the stock exchange, or music or a collection of pictures or insects, for others it is some woman who can give them the dainties they like. You might offer these last all the women on earth they would turn up their noses, they will have the only one who can gratify their passion. It often happens that the woman does not care for them at all, and treats them cruelly, they by their morsels of satisfaction very dear, but no matter, the fools are never tired of it, they will take their last blanket to the pawnbrokers to give their last five franc piece to her. Father Goriot here is one of that sort. He is discreet, so the Countess exploits him just the way of the gay world. The poor old fellow thinks of her and of nothing else. In all other respects you see he is a stupid animal, but get him on that subject, and his eyes sparkle like diamonds. That secret is not difficult to guess. He took some plate himself this morning to the melting pot, and I saw him at Daddy Gob's sex in the Rue de Gretels. And now, Mark what follows he came back here, and gave a letter for the Contest de Restaurant to that noodle of a Christophe, who showed us the address, there was a receipted bill inside it. It is clear that it was an urgent matter if the Countess also went herself to the old money lender. Father Goriot has financed her handsome leave. There is no need to tack the tail together, the thing is self-evident. So that shows you, sir student, that all the time your Countess was smiling, dancing, flirting, swaying her peach flower crowned head, with her gown gathered into her hand, her slippers were pinching her, as they say, she was thinking of her protested bills, or her lover's protested bills. You have made me wild to know the truth, cried Eugene, I will go to call on Madame de Restre tomorrow. Yes, echoed Poirot, you must go and call on Madame de Restre. And perhaps you will find Father Goriot there, who will take payment for the assistance he politely rendered. Eugene looked disgusted. Why, then, this Paris of yours is a slough. And an uncommonly queer slough, too, replied Vortran. The mud splashes you as you drive through it in your carriage you are a respectable person, you go afoot and art splashed you are a scoundrel. You are so unlucky as to walk off with something or other belonging to somebody else, and they exhibit you as a curiosity in the place du collect de justice, you steal a million and you are pointed out in every salon as a model of virtue. And you pay thirty millions for the police and the courts of justice, for the maintenance of law and order. The pretty slate of things it is. What? cried Madame. Vorcure, has Father Goriot really melted down his silver posset dish? There were two turtle doves on the lid, were there not? Asked Eugene. Yes, that there were. Then, was he fond of it? Said Eugene. He cried while he was breaking up the cup and plate. I happened to see him by accident. It was dear to him as his own life, answered the widow. There. You see how infatuated the old fellow is, cried Vortran. The woman yonder can coax the soul out of him. The student went up to his room. Vortran went out, and a few moments later Madame Couture and Victorine drove away in a cab which Sylvie had called for them. Poirot gave his arm to Mademoiselle. Mickenito out, and they went together to spend the two sunniest hours of the day in the jar de plants. Well, those two are as good as married, 
was the portly Sylvie's comment. They are going out together to date for the first time. They are such a couple of dry sticks that if they happen to strike against each other they will draw sparks like flint and steel. Keep clear of Mademoiselle. Mickey or shawl, then, said Madame. Vorkure, laughing, it would flare up like tinder. At four o'clock that evening, when Goriette came in, he saw, by the light of two smoky lamps, that Victorine's eyes were red. Madame. Vorkure was listening to the history of the visit made that morning to M. Topyefer. It had been made in vain. Topyefer was tired of the annual application made by his daughter and her elderly friend. He gave them a personal interview in order to arrive at an understanding with them. My dear lady, said Madame. Couture, addressing Madame. Vorkure, just imagine it. He did not even ask Victorine to sit down. She was standing the whole time. He said to me quite coolly, without putting himself in a passion, that we might spare ourselves the trouble of going there, that the young lady he would not call her his daughter was injuring her cause by importuning him underscore importuning exclamation point underscore once a year, the wretch, that as Victorine's mother had nothing when he married her, Victorine ought not to expect anything from him, in fact, he said the most cruel things, that made the poor child burst out crying, the little thing threw herself at her father's feet and spoke up bravely, she said that she only persevered in her visits for her mother's sake, that she would obey him without a murmur, but that she begged him to read her poor dead mother's farewell letter. She took it up and gave it to him, saying the most beautiful things in the world, most beautifully expressed, I do not know where she learned them, God must have put them into her head, for the poor child was inspired to speak so nicely that it made me cry like a fool to hear her talk. And what do you think a monster was doing all the time? cutting his nails. He took the letter that poor Madame Topyefer had soaked with tears, and flung it onto the chimney piece. That is all right, he said. He held out his hands to raise his daughter, but she covered them with kisses, and he drew them away again. Scandalous, isn't it? And his great booby of a son came in and took no notice of his sister. What inhuman wretches they must be, said Father Goriette. And then they both went out of the room. Madame Couture went on, without heeding the worthy vermicelli maker's exclamation, father and son bowed to me, and asked me to excuse them on account of urgent business. That is the history of our call. Well, he has seen his daughter at any rate. How he can refuse to acknowledge her I cannot think, for they are as alike as two peas. The boarders drop in one after another, interchanging greetings and empty jokes that certain classes of Parisians regard as humorous and witty. Dullness is their prevailing ingredient, and the whole point consists in mispronouncing the word or gesture. This kind of argot is always changing. The essence of the jest consists in some catch word suggested by a political event, an incident in the police courts, a street song, or a bit of burlesque at some theater, and forgotten in a month. Anything and everything serves to keep up the game of battle door and shuttlecock with words and ideas. The diorama, the recent invention, which carried an optical illusion the degree further than panoramas, had given rise to a mania among art students for ending every word with underscore comma underscore. The Maison Vorkur had caught the infection from a young artist among the boarders. Well, Monsieur R. Poirot, said the underscore employee underscore from the museum, how is your health arama? Then, without waiting for an answer, he turned to Madame Couture and Victorine with eight ladies, you seem melancholy. His dinner ready cried Horace Bianchin, the medical student, and a friend of Rastignac's, my stomach is sinking underscore a squeady talents underscore. There is an uncommon underscore frozirama underscore outside, said Wartron. Make room there, Father Goriette. Confound it, your foot covers the whole front of the stove. Illustrious and Wartron, put in Bianchin, why do you say underscore frozirama underscore? It is incorrect, it should be underscore frozenirama underscore. No. It shouldn't, said the official from the museum, underscore frozirama underscore is right by the same rule that you say my feet are underscore froze underscore. Ah. Ah. Here is His Excellency the Marquis de Rastignac, Doctor of the Law of Contraries, cried Bianchin, seizing Eugene by the throat, and almost throttling him. Alone there. Alone. Mademoiselle. Mickey now came noiselessly in, bowed to the rest of the party and took her place beside the three women without saying the word. 
that old bat always makes me shudder, said by Ankin in a low voice, indicating Mademoiselle. Mickney or out of order. I have studied Gaul's system, and I am sure she has the bump of Judas. Then you have seen the case before. Said Wartran. Who has not? Answered by Ankin. Upon my word, that ghastly old maid looks just like one of the long worms that will gnaw a beam through, give them time enough. That is the way, young man, returned he of the forty years and the dyed whiskers. The rose has lived the life of the rose, the morning's space. Ha ha. Here is a magnificent underscore soup o underscore, cried Poiret as Christophe came in bearing the soup with cautious heed. I beg your pardon, sir, said Madame. Vorkure, it is underscore soup underscore. All the young men roared with laughter. Have you there, Poiret? Poiter Arardret? She had you there. Score two points to Mama Vorkure, said Vortran. Did any of you notice the fog this morning? Asked the official. It was a frantic fog said by Ankin, the fog unparalleled, doleful, melancholy, sea-green, asthmatical agoria of a fog. Agoria, said the art student, because you couldn't see a thing in it. Hey! Milord J. Ariat, they air talking about you oh oh you. Father Agoria, seated at the lower end of the table, close to the door through which the servant entered, raised his face, he had smelled at a scrap of bread that lay under his table napkin an old trick acquired in his commercial capacity, that still showed itself at times. Well, Madame Vorkure cried in sharp tones, that rang above the rattle of spoons and plates and the sound of other voices, and is there anything the matter with the bread? Nothing whatever, Madame, he answered, on the contrary, it is made of the best quality of corn, flour from eight tampes. How could you tell? Asked Eugene. By the color, by the flavor. You knew the flavor by the smell, I suppose, said Madame. Vorkure. You have grown so economically, you will find out how to live on the smell of cooking at last. Take out a patent for it, then, cried the museum official, you would make a handsome fortune. Never mind him, said the artist, he does that sort of thing to delude us into thinking that he was a vermicelli maker. Your nose is a corn sampler, it appears. Inquired the official. Corn underscore what underscore? Asked by Ankin. Corn now. Corn debt. Corn bellion. Corn ice. Corn bucupa. Corn crate. Corn cockle. Corn derma. The eight responses came like the rolling fire from every part of the room, and the laughter that followed was the more uproarious because poor Father Goriot stared at the others with a puzzled look, like a foreigner trying to catch the meaning of words in a language which he does not understand. Corn? He said, turning to Vortran, his next neighbor. Corn on your foot, old man, said Vortran, and he drove Father Goriath's cap down over his eyes by a blow on the crown, 